Welcome to the 700 Club, and thanks so much for joining with us. Well, our first story is about the U.S. and Israel. We're on a collision course over the invasion of Rafah. Vice President Kamala Harris threatened consequences if Israel goes forward. <coughs> Prime Minister Netanyahu says invading Rafah is the only path to total victory over Hamas. In Gaza, Israeli forces are taking the fight to Hamas terrorists holed up in the Al Shifa hospital. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. In Gaza, the IDF announced after six days of fighting, it's eliminated 170 Hamas terrorists who used the Al Shifa hospital as a base, and it's captured 800 more. This operation isn't over yet. Right now, Hamas and Islamic Jihad terrorists are barricading themselves inside the Shifa hospital wards. Hamas is destroying the Shifa hospital. Israel's defense minister is heading to Washington to meet Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and other officials to discuss the war in Gaza and to ensure the flow of weapons and materials necessary for Israel's air defense systems. Also this week, a delegation of Israeli government officials visiting Washington will discuss plans to invade Rafah, the last Hamas stronghold in Gaza. The U.S. opposes the operation and wants to explore alternatives. Sunday, Vice President Kamala Harris wouldn't rule out consequences if Israel launches its operation into Rafah to defeat Hamas. We have been clear in multiple conversations and in every way that any major military operation in Rafah would be a huge mistake. Those consequences could include placing conditions on future U.S. military aid. On Friday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told Secretary of State Israel's decision. I also said that we have no way to defeat Hamas without going into Rafah and eliminating the rest of the battalions there. And I told him that I hope we will do it with the support of the USA, but if we have to, we'll do it alone. Today, Israelis here in Jerusalem are celebrating the biblical feast of Purim, celebrating when Queen Esther defeated a Persian plot to exterminate the Jews. It's especially meaningful this year when Jews again feel they're fighting for their survival after October 7th. The whole world don't understand that never again should not happen again. And what is never, never is the 7th of October. In Jerusalem, Christians from around the world celebrated Palm Sunday, the day Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey and was hailed by crowds as their Messiah. Even during this time of war, Christians flocked to the holy city, both to worship God and support Israel. I know there's a lot going on here in the Holy Land, and I'm here to pray for the Jews. I'm here to pray for everyone. It's my love of Jesus Christ, why I'm here. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Oh, we need to stand with Israel. This is an existential threat to them. Hamas has vowed to repeat October 7 again and again and again. Let's go back to the fight against Nazi Germany. And could you imagine our president, Roosevelt, saying, well, I'm, I'm willing to do a hostage negotiation. I'm, I'm willing to pull back our troops. I'm willing to do, you know, other things. We, we need to have peace. We can't go in and bomb uh, Germany. We can't invade Normandy. We can't, we can't do these things. He would have never thought of it. And he said very clearly, what we need here is unconditional surrender. And that's exactly the message we need to be sending to Hamas. We don't need to be equivocating and showing our weakness. We need to tell them quite clearly, you have to unconditionally surrender. You have to release all the hostages. That seems to be completely forgotten that there are over 100 people still in tunnels against their will. That is a war crime. And all these talks about war crime and all the... Hamas started this. They're the one that invaded on October 7th. They're the one that took the hostages. Let's keep the pressure on. Let's show solidarity with the Israeli people. And when we say never again, we really mean it. Well, in northern Israel, tensions are rising after Hezbollah fired more than 50 rockets at the Galilee over the weekend. Ephraim Graham has that story and more from the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, as the IDF prepares for potential war with Hezbollah, the remaining residents of northern Israel could soon be on the front lines. 
CBN News contributor Chuck Holton reports from the Maronite Christian village of Jish near the Lebanese border. In this small village located in the hills of northern Israel, daily life continues despite the threat of war. Daily rocket attacks by Hezbollah keep the region in a state of heightened alert with fear of an imminent escalation. In response, Israel is launching strikes deep into Lebanon, targeting firing positions, ammunition depots, and key operatives. The Hezbollah have today also drones. They have precision-guided missiles. They have 80,000 fighters with elite unit well-trained in Syria, civil war 10 years with Wagner force, with Syria, with Iranian forces. So we know that they are very dangerous because they have a very radical Islamic Shia ideology. Maronite Christians here have a long history of persevering through adversity. As they face the prospect of another war, they draw upon their rich heritage and the support of their tight-knit community. Well, we're still gathering in our church as usual, uh, albeit with uh, maybe a bit of a larger number. We are peaceful people. We pray for peace. We want peace. We want the war to come to an end. And we pray for that uh, purpose. The Israeli Defense Forces have evacuated everybody who lives between where I'm standing and the Lebanese border, which is that hillside right back behind me. It's only about 4.6 kilometers from here. And I'm standing right on the edges of a Maronite Christian community called Jish. The people who live here have not been evacuated. And if they want to leave, they can leave on their own, but they won't get help from the government to do so. And that means that the people who have decided to stay are trusting in the IDF and in God to keep them safe. This is not existential threat only for Israel. Hezbollah terrorists are existential threat to the Maronites here in Israel and to any other population in Israel as Israelis and to the Maronites on Lebanon too because they want to turn Lebanon to Islamic state. The IDF is preparing to protect people here if all-out conflict breaks out. With emergency shelters and essential supplies, Home Front Command is working to ensure the safety of civilians, bringing in bomb shelters, and providing refuge for those in need. We face so many persecution and oppression and genocide during uh, centuries in this land. And our faith is the only one who kept us standing in this land, in our forefathers' land, not giving up for any other foreign forces who trying to submit us under Islamic rules. And that's because we believe in Jesus, the Messiah, our Savior, that told us, never fear, because I am with you. As rockets continue to fall and counterattacks persist, people here remain caught in the middle. For the evacuated, returning home is a dream that won't be realized until a lasting resolution can be found. Despite those challenges, the resilience and faith of these communities remain unshakable. From northern Israel, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Sunday, Russia observed a day of mourning after Friday's terror attack on a Moscow theater. At least 137 people lost their lives. The Islamic militant group ISIS claims responsibility for the deadly assault. Now U.S. officials are on alert for attacks against American targets abroad and at home. Dale Hurd reports. Four men accused of staging the Russian concert hall attack that killed more than 130 people appeared before a Moscow court showing signs of severe beatings. All four were charged with terrorism. One appeared to be barely conscious during Sunday's hearing. All of the men are from the Central Asian Republic of Tajikistan, which borders Afghanistan. The massacre happened in an auditorium on the outskirts of Moscow as a crowd gathered for a sold-out rock concert. People in their seats heard what sounded like fireworks. At least four men with automatic weapons had begun firing repeatedly into the crowd. Then they set the concert hall on fire. ISIS-K, the terror group's affiliate in Afghanistan, was quick to claim responsibility for the attack. The same group is responsible for the killing of 13 U.S. service members during the pullout from Afghanistan. Russian President Vladimir Putin claims the men were headed to Ukraine, where persons there were preparing to let them cross the border. But Vice President Kamala Harris said that's not true. 
there is no whatsoever any evidence, and in fact, what we know to be the case is that ISIS-K is actually, um, by all accounts, responsible for what happened. What has U.S. leaders very concerned is the possibility that a similar terrorist massacre could happen here in the U.S. or against Americans overseas. And they'll do it here in the homeland. And it we're very, I think we should be very concerned, as the FBI director confirmed to me, that there is a wing, there is a trafficking network out there that specializes in moving people. They do it for profit, moving people and migrants around the world, including across our southern border, who have links to ISIS. The head of U.S. Border Patrol, Jason Owens, was asked if he's concerned. Absolutely. That's, uh, that, you, you ask any law enforcement officer, especially somebody that works in border security, that is what keeps us up at night. And if we don't know who is coming into our country and we don't know what their intent is, that is a threat. And they're exploiting a vulnerability that's on our border right now. Former FBI Special Agent Eric Karen told CBN News he's especially concerned about America's ports, where Customs and Border Protection physically inspect only 3% of incoming containers. We have 328 ports of entry into America. They all have to be secure and Many of them are soft. Karen says last year there were over a thousand joint terrorism task force cases related to sleeper cells and terrorist threats in the U.S. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Definite cause for concern. Gordon? It's an absolute cause for concern. When you look at ISIS K, it's ISIS Khorasan, Islamic State Khorasan. It's a geographic area in, primarily in Afghanistan, and in the withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, this group was allowed, uh, and I'll, I'll underline allowed, to now flourish. And in that, you can see these terrorist attacks. So our hearts go out to everyone who was involved in Russia, uh, all those victims. It, it, it's absolutely horrific, but that could also happen here because we are part one of their targets. Uh, we're, we're not just innocent bystanders. From their standpoint, we're a target. And that is throughout the Islamic world. 9-11 was part of an overall plan. And you see this ideology being repeated and repeated and repeated, that Israel is the little Satan, and guess who's the great Satan? The United States of America. So they will feel righteous in attacking us. They will, they've been indoctrinated in that. Now, when you look at our current foreign policy, you've got to scratch your head. Are, are we ha do we have any understanding of it? Do we have any understanding of the threat to our homeland posed by these groups? Uh, it seems that we don't. Why in, the, why in the world would you send $10 billion to Iran in the middle of the current conflict with Hamas, what the Houthis are doing against shipping, uh, you're rewarding them for state sponsorship of terror. They're the primary supplier of weapons to Hezbollah. You're rewarding them for launching rockets into uh, Israel. It, it, this makes no sense. Here's something else that won't make any sense. Guess who uh, said we're, we're going to support Russia in this attack? It's Hamas. Here's the statement they put out. We in the Islamic resistant movement, Hamas, condemn in the strongest terms the terrorist attack that targeted civilians in the Russian capital, Moscow, and left dozens dead and wounded. We extend our sincere condolences to the Russian leadership and people and to the families of the victims of this criminal attack. And we wish a speedy recovery to the injured. And we express our full solidarity with Russia, its people, and the families of the victims in this tragedy. What an incredible... <laughs> you, you, what, what universe they live in, is it okay to kill Jews? Is that what they're essentially saying? It's okay to launch October 7th? throw the whole world into turmoil, and, and somehow or other you're going to ex, 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 express solidarity with Russia. This is, it, it's, it's crazy ideology. And in this crazy ideology, please stand for the truth. Thou shalt not kill. Let us adhere to that. Let's not have that be some wistful uh, hope in the future. 
Can we do it? Can we do it now? Can we stand against this incredible evil that seems to be spreading? It's being called the most important abortion case since the end of Roe versus Wade. Tomorrow, the Supreme Court will hear arguments on whether to restrict access to what's widely known as the abortion pill. CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson tells us what's at stake. As a college freshman, Rebecca Hagen learned she had an unwanted pregnancy. There was the absence of hope. I felt desperate. Like many women who choose abortion, Rebecca took mifeprestone, also called mifeprex. Immediately, regret set in. Oh, my word. You know, can I take back this decision? Can I save this baby? Rebecca became an exception as she was able to reverse the pill's effects and go on to deliver a healthy baby. With most women who take it, however, the baby dies. What's more, the mother often suffers complications, which can include sepsis or even death. The further in pregnancy she is, the more common it is that she's going to have to have surgery, sometimes emergency surgery, for hemorrhage, for, you know, a, a massive amount of bleeding or for tissue left inside. Back in 2000, the Food and Drug Administration approved mifepristone to be taken up to seven weeks into pregnancy and that women be given the pill at one of three required in-person doctor visits. Beginning in 2016, the FDA began removing those safeguards. One change makes the pills much easier to get because in-person visits are no longer required. Another change, the gestation limit was raised to 10 weeks pregnant. It currently allows uh, abortion drugs to be mailed to women uh, in their dorm rooms uh, without ever seeing in person a health care provider. That, that's reckless um, and FDA should fix that. Tuesday, Regent Law Professor Aaron Hawley will ask the U.S. Supreme Court to order the original safeguards be put back in place. Recently, she practiced answering questions from other Regent Law professors acting as justices. FDA's own current label for the drug notes that between 2.9 and 4.6 percent of women, that's roughly 1 in 25, will go to the emergency room. And that was before they stripped away the in-person visit. Holly says FDA research conducted after removing the safeguards shows they made a dangerous drug even more so and admits to relying on emergency physicians to treat complications. One of the studies they discussed said as many as one in eight women will need unplanned medical care after taking these drugs. Holly represents a group of pro-life doctors who claim when the FDA relaxed mifepristone's prescribing guidelines, it made women less safe. And we know that the incidence of complications from uh, chemical abortions, from these abortion drugs, are increasing. While that creates more suffering for patients, it also weighs on pro-life doctors by putting them in the position of becoming complicit in an abortion. And if a woman comes in who's bleeding, and, her, and she's bleeding enough that it threatens her life, and her baby still has a heartbeat, we're going to take the baby because that's going to affect, it. we could lose both of them. So what that does is it forces us to be a partner in the abortion process, in the elective abortion process. Harrison adds the doctor's deeply held beliefs are violated even more now that mifepristone is so widely available. What's happening now is people that aren't even medically trained are starting this procedure and dumping their complications on those of us who value the life of the of the mom and the life of her baby and it's it's medically ethically wrong and because of the relaxed regulations women in states where abortion is banned or limited can get access to mifepristone right now the abortion pill is available online and that ships all over the country and it ships from overseas and what's worse is that women are being told by the person who supplies the abortion drug to lie to the ER doc and not tell them. The doctor group pushed for an outright ban on mifepristone. As a Christian, I believe that, that every life is inherently valuable, no matter how small, uh, no matter if that life is not yet born. The court, however, agreed to only consider the issue of access, including whether women can skip the doctor visits and receive pills by mail. Holly still believes if the court rules in their favor, lives will be saved.
So we always work with excellence um, as unto the Lord, but we can also count on him for the, the process and the results, and, and we can lean on his strength and, and his wisdom, and so trust that to him. And that, that really helps with a case like this um, that, that's going up before the Supreme Court and knowing ultimately um, that God is in control. A decision is expected in June. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Well, obviously a lot of um, consequences to what the Supreme Court is going to decide, so I encourage you to please pray for them. For me, the, the bottom line should be, let us do everything we can to protect women. Uh, if you have these pill suppliers um, advising them to lie to ER personnel, that, that shows you just how dangerous this thing is. And, and it needs to be done, if it's done at all, it needs to be done under medical supervision so that uh, women's lives and, and physical health aren't at risk. Um, so pray for our Supreme Court today. Uh, they're going to need guidance on the way through. Terry? Don didn't think he was going to make it to the ER. His son had to carry him to the car. Don was experiencing crushing chest pain, and he needed immediate surgery. It got stronger and stronger. It had control and you, you just stopped. It was late April, 2022, when Don Jockman started having intense chest pain. He called his cardiologist who urged him to get to an emergency room immediately. I was afraid because you don't know what's happening. You kind of realize what's happening is not right. I was concerned. There was a lot of prayer inside of me going on. You're hoping, you want it to be good. Too weak to drive himself, Don called his son, Brandon. He says just getting to the car was a struggle. Oh, the pain was strong, and I took about 10, 12 steps, and it hit hard. I said, Brandon, I need help. I, 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 I'm not gonna make it. And he basically carried me. I walked with my feet, but I put my arm around his head and shoulders. They drove to St. David's Medical Center in Austin, Texas, where doctors performed a heart catheterization to determine what was causing the pain. They said, you're blocked. Your aorta on one side is 100%, the other side is 98%, and the third one, you're really blocked. Surgery is the only option. They told Don he needed a triple bypass as soon as possible and admitted him to the hospital. The surgery, however, would have to wait. I was on blood thinners and my blood was, would not clot and they could not operate. So they put it off for three days, hoping that would be enough time. But I was praying, thanking him for his presence and to get me through it and just, Lord be with me. Don wasn't the only one praying. By now there was an outpouring of prayer as his daughter, Jennifer, reached out to family, their church, and anyone else she could think of to pray. The situation was so severe, and you know what's at risk, you know what's at stake. And there were times that I battled fear, and um, I had to trust God and pray more. I knew that God answers prayers, that God hears His people, so I tried to reach out to as many people as I could. By day three, Don was still in no condition for surgery. That night, he turned on the television. The 700 Club was on, and Gordon was praying. I'm getting a visual picture of someone in a hospital bed, and it, either you just finished a procedure or you're getting ready for one. God is healing you. He is restoring you right now. As you're listening to me, faith is building within your body. Jesus is coming to you now with healing. We receive it now. That's got to be me. I felt blessed, assured. God used that situation to speak to me, to tell me, I've got you. You have your problem. I've got you. Four more days passed with no sign of improvement. Doctors decided they couldn't wait any longer and went ahead with the triple bypass. It was successful, but they still couldn't get Don's blood to clot. Jennifer says the prayers continued. During my prayer time with God, I was very honest. God, just be with my dad. God, be with us all. My dad is like my best friend. 
that I wasn't ready to lose that. Then, two days later, they had a breakthrough. Listening to their conversations and then became aware that they had solved the clotting problem. The Lord had kept his word. Don was discharged after a week of recovery and went home to begin rehab. I could have died. I know how close I was, but God had something for me. He brought me through the operation, through the rehabilitation, and to this present day. Don fully recovered and has had no heart problems since. My faith is stronger. The closeness with the Lord grow stronger day by day. He has put things in my heart, and the closer you get to him, the more he reveals himself to you. You know, we never see God stronger or more clearly than when we're in a situation where there's nothing we can do. We're out of control. God loves to let us know that he sees us, that he knows us, that he hears us, and that his heart desire is to touch our lives. So stand strong in whatever situation you're facing today, whether you're praying for yourself today or for someone else, stand strong. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he wants to do something right in the midst of your circumstances today. I want to mention that this is Julia. She comes from Holiday, Florida. For over a year, she suffered immensely from a gallstone issue that caused great pain under her ribs. It also hindered her mobility and caused her significant digestive issues. She was watching this program, and just as the prayer segment was ending, Gordon, you said, Julia, your gallbladder is healed now, and all that pain is going to leave you now, and all that infection in Jesus' name, amen. Julia felt a tingling sensation go through her and a popping under her ribs, along with a strange gurgling. She stood up, started bending in all directions and jumping up and down. All the pain was gone. She could do what she hadn't been able to do for over a year. She will never forget the day God called her by name during this broadcast and healed her. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. In the Gospel of John, he says he calls you by name. So, Julia, yay. Here's Patty from Clarksville, Tennessee. For three months, she had severe allergies, including significant post-nasal drip. Her days were filled with coughing up mucus, feeling miserable. Her ribs hurt badly. She found it difficult to breathe at times. Well, she's watching this show. Terry said, someone has a lung condition. Take a deep breath. God is healing that condition for you. By faith, Patty put her hands on her chest, raised her hands to indicate her trust in the Lord. She is thrilled to report she is now able to walk, talk, swallow, and breathe without any allergy oh. symptoms, and she gives all glory to God. Oh. Do that. Give glory to God. Give glory for what he's done, how he's given us all these wonderful things. He's seated us in heavenly places. He has given us every single spiritual gift. He knows us by name. He numbers the very hairs on our head. He does all of these things because he loves us. Now, when you get convinced of that love, then faith gets very, very easy. So let's trust him. Let's believe him and let God do what he's promised to do. Lord God Almighty, we come to you and we come standing on your word. Your word has caused us to hope that you forgive all our iniquities. You heal all our diseases. You know us by name and you call us by name. So, Lord, stretch forth your hand to your children today and heal them, restore them. Let them know how much you love them and how much you care for them. Be with them now, for I ask it in Jesus' name. There's someone you have a, a condition where your, your, your bones are um, very fragile. It's like they shatter. Um, and I don't know the name of it, but what I just described, you know because you're living with it and it's, it's horrible for you. God is giving your, you new bones. He's able to recreate calcium for you. He's able to strengthen them. And so let that strength be in your bones now in Jesus' name. Let there be no more shattering, no more breaks, no more problems in the name of Jesus from the top of your head to the soles of your feet, may every part of your skeleton be healed now 
in Jesus' name. There's someone else. You have a um, like a raspiness that's set into your speaking. You haven't been diagnosed with the condition, but it just doesn't ever go away anymore. It sometimes is uncomfortable, uh, but mostly it makes your communication difficult. God is healing that for you right now. Just begin to lift up your hands, thank Him, begin to speak, and your voice will clear as you speak. You're going back to normal again. Someone else, you have severe burning in your feet, like the soles of your feet are, uh, they, they feel swollen. They feel, they're just burning and painful. God's healing that for you right now. That neuropathy is just leaving in Jesus' name, be made whole. Um, there's someone you're su suffering with, uh, high blood pressure, hypertension has been diagnosed over you, and God is able to release all of that and re relax every vein and every artery and bring your blood pressure back into normal range. Be healed now in Jesus' name. Someone else, you've got blinding headaches. I'm, I'm not sure they're migraines. It's just so severe, you get doubled over and, and you it, it's incapacitating. God is healing it and he's taking it away from it. You just felt it leave. In the name of Jesus, be healed and be made whole, and may it never, ever return. May you be sealed away from that and never, ever experience this pain again. There's someone else. You've been diagnosed with a condition called roseola. I don't really know what that is, but God's healing you of it right now in Jesus' name. Receive that. Lord, we thank you. You are our healer. You are our deliverer. You're our Savior. We, we thank you for all that you do for us. Be with us now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share in your good report. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. And if you need prayer, we're here for you. The number's the same. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Good news from the Justice Department. Crime is dropping across the country. New FBI data points to an improving post-pandemic landscape. According to the 2023 fourth quarter numbers, murders fell about 13% from 2022 to 2023. In that same time, the Bureau reports violent crime fell 6% across America. CBN Thailand's Operation Blessing recently collab collaborated with the Kazaya brand for the beloved charity fashion show and art exhibition. Kazaya, a print fabric brand by two young Thai designers, previously showcased their work as part of New York Fashion Week. With a desire to inspire young people to use their creative potential for their community, the show organized, was organized to raise awareness and support for CBN School of Life and Family Project in Thailand. Now you can learn more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. Garbage flying everywhere, trees spinning, and pieces of metal ripping off the roof. Elmer and his family were terrified when a Category 5 hurricane hit their house. Then after the storm passed, they were left with utter devastation. Elmer and his family spent a terror-filled night when a Category 5 hurricane blasted through their home in Mexico. I was scared. The storm was getting worse and the roof fell on us. We took shelter under some stairs, but a piece of metal roof still hit my mom. Elmer's mom, Monica, described the aftermath. The whole roof blew off. The tree looked like it was spinning. After the disaster, Elmer heard that a church supported by Operation Blessing was providing hot meals and clean water for affected families. I went there and they gave me food. I took a plate for my brother and for my mother. Then we went to visit Elmer's home. Our house is full of garbage that was flying around. We could have sleep because when it rains, we get wet. Thanks to supporters of Operation Blessing, we provided Monica and her family with new polycarbonate vinyl sheets for the roof. We also gave them food, a solar lamp, a mattress, and a tarp to temporarily cover the house until they could repair it. With help from their neighbors, they soon installed the new roof. Now, we will finally sleep well. I feel very happy because it is a miracle that you helped us. Elmer also watched CBN Superbook at the church, 
met Gizmo, and learned how to trust God in tough times. God is good and powerful, and I know that He will take care of us no matter what. And when we explained to them how God had used people to help in the midst of the disaster, the whole family prayed to become Christians. I feel very excited knowing that one prayer can bring so many good things. I thank you very much. That's you in action. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you are responsible for helping that wonderful family in their moment of need. If you're not a member, I encourage you to join with us. You join with everything we're doing around the world, whether it's Operation Blessing, Disaster Relief, or Water Wells, or Special Surgeries, or Preaching the Gospel through CBN International. You're a part of all of it when you join. So call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to be a member of the 700 Club. How much is that? Well, it's just $20 a month. That breaks out to 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at higher levels. We have them, 700 Club Gold at $40 a month. 1,000 Club, $1,000 a year, that's $84 a month. Whatever level, when you call, ask for Pledge Express when you, uh, when you call so that you can have the, the bank doing all the work. There are no checks to write anymore. It's all done electronically, and we send as our gift to you Power for Life monthly teaching CDs. So if you'd like those, ask for Pledge Express when, when you call. Or you can go to CBN.com and you give monthly on the Internet. You'll automatically sign up for Pledge Express. There's also, you can text the letters CBN to 71777. Either way, do it right now. 1-800-700-7000. Bandana, dark glasses, sunglasses, a white shirt, black Dickies pants, and Nike Cortez sneakers. Back in the day, people knew Mondo de la Vega was a gang member the second they saw him. But not anymore. Mondo's incredible journey has taken him from gangster to grace. Mondo De La Vega is an executive producer at the PTL Network and hosts his own show. One would never guess the kind of life he once lived. Escaping abuse and violence in Central America, Mondo's mother took her kids to Los Angeles. The gangs there welcomed teenage Mondo with open arms. In My Crazy Life, Mondo tells how God took an angry, bitter young man and turned him into a loving husband and father. Mondo De La Vega is with us now, and we welcome you to the 700. What an honor it's so to be wonderful with you. So wonderful to have you here. Thank you. Your book, mm. your life, your story. <laughs> I mean, it, it's quite, uh, it is miraculous. When you were young, in the very beginning, your life was beautiful. You had yeah. great family time. You lived in uh, a very Latino, Hispanic yeah. family that was very tight. And then out of the blue, one day, that's all blown up by your dad's violence really yeah. toward your mother and I don't know what was going on in his head and heart but it surely affected you then your mom who's an American citizen gets yeah. you and your sister back into the United States from where you were living to keep you safe but you move into an LA neighborhood that's anything but safe I'm prepared so how tell me tell me how you got into the whole gang mentality because it's not where you were coming from when you moved there no. you know I was already primed to be a part of the gang because of the anger and the abandonment and, mm. and, and the vengeance that, that was inside of me from what my father had done to my mother. Yeah. The gangs love to prey on kids like me, kids that are hurting, kids that don't feel like they belong, but yet we knew that it was a false identity, but yet that's all we had. Yeah. That's all we needed. The only thing that kept us together was the same brokenness that we experienced, but yet we never talked about it. Yeah. We were not allowed to talk about it. And you did really need it, in a sense, because there was a lot of violence in your neighborhood. I mean, without the gang, you weren't going to survive very long as a good kid in that you environment. Know, Terry, when you're reminded every single day, don't make plans past 18 years old because you're not going to live. The title of my book is Mi Vida Loca. It's the three dots, the three destinations, the three roads that gang life leads to. One, you're going to either end up in the hospital in a coma. Number two, you're going to end up in prison the rest of your life. Or number three, you're going to experience death. So imagine being reminded from the age of eight all the way up to your teens that you're not going to make it past 18 years old, so don't make plans. 
you live on that survival mode. What, what impact did it have on your life that from the time your dad was violent toward your mom, he wasn't in your life anymore? What, what impact as a boy did that have on you? Loneliness, brokenness, anxiety, uh, not feeling valued. Yeah. When my father walked away, I felt my hero walked away. Yeah. That was my man. That was my, my everything. So watching my father walk away from the responsibility, it left me empty because it left me empty in the idea that I don't want to be a family man. I don't want to have kids. I don't want to be a husband because if that's what it looks like, I don't know if I can be it. Yes. And so it left a big void. And what happened was I was asleep. And in my sleep, I will be crying for my father mm -hmm. because of that abandonment. I think it shows you that how important fathers are. Sure. The, the critical uh, actions that your father does impacts you very deeply, but it became a tool that I used to, in the gang, to survive. Sure. I used it to protect myself. You couldn't, there was an old saying in the neighborhood, the weakness of a warrior was love and compassion. Mm -hmm. If I showed compassion and love, it would be used against me. Most of us in the streets ended up dying. They didn't want to deal with it. Yeah. You know, so the pain was pretty brutal. But your sister, while you're going through all of this, your sister and your mom are finding Jesus. Yeah. And, and they're, they're now in church and their life is changing. And you're with this hardcore gang, yeah. really, the, yeah. the, the deepest and the worst that there was in the neighborhood. Yeah. Your sister then asked you three questions that started to make you think she walked in and she said what if God is real what if prayer works what if you have a different destiny remember the gangs were telling me don't make plans past 18 years old because you're not going to live that long then society was telling me lock them up and throw the key away so when you have that type of pressure you don't see your destiny past what your what people are telling you so you begin to believe it but when this young girl came in and it, it, listen you have to risk your reputation yeah. You have to risk everything to know that what God spoke to you, you're going to walk in and deliver a prophetic word no matter what the results look like. Yeah. She walked in and delivered those three, and it started tormenting me. Well, talk about she, she invited you to go to church. I mean, just <laughs> yes. simply going with her puts your life at risk. Yeah. So you go to church, and speaking of a prophetic word, what happened? The preacher began to preach about this Jesus that I've never understood. Yet this preacher was a former gang member that was one of my enemies. And I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, wait a minute, my sister set me up because on the left side, I see gang members that look like me. On the right side, I look, uh, you know, the OGs. Yet the difference was they had their hands raised and they were crying, they were clapping, they were cheering. And I'm standing all the way in the back with two nine millimeter Berettas, lokes on, bandanas on, and I'm thinking my sister set me up. Yet she did set me up because this preacher began to talk about Jesus in a way that I've never experienced. Yet, when he said he loves you, he he's not interested in getting even with you. He got even at the cross. Yeah. If he only knew he's crazy about you. Terry, as I'm walking away, because I couldn't believe that God can love me. I, I was so devalued, yet I had the respect that the neighborhood gives you. I had the retaliation that you live for. I had everything that they needed me to be, yet I felt empty. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I'm not good enough to be here. I'm going to walk away. I'm used to listening to Tupac Shakur. I'm listening to yeah. Snoop Dogg, NWA. They were all storytellers. Is that I'm getting ready to walk away because I didn't feel good enough. An old hymn. Yeah. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw. I don't know why, Terry, it hit me so hard. Well, you know, Jesus said, when we know the truth, the truth will set us free. And that is exactly what happened to you. Today, you're a pastor, oh. <laughs> you're, and, and you have your own TV show, and you're sharing your testimony and interviewing other people about their testimonies. You know, when God redeems, he does it from A to Z. <laughs> First class. Listen, the world said, lock them up, throw the key away. Today, I'm here next to the beautiful Terry, the legend, <laughs> and I'm thinking God's grace it's more than what we ever asked mm -hmm. for. And to understand that he loves you and he, only Jesus. In the back of the book, I say, if only Jesus can turn a gangster to grace. 
If he can do that for me, can you imagine what he can do with you? Yeah, it's amazing. It's an amazing story. I want to say we have all like skimmed the surface of it. Mondo's book is called My Crazy Life. What I love about this is it's such a picture of going from being totally lost to complete redemption and fresh beginnings. It's available nationwide. Just want to suggest that you get it and enjoy seeing what God has done in the life of one man. Thank, Thank you, you, Mondo. Terry. What a pleasure Appreciate to have it. you here. The Lord bless you and your work. Here's a word from Romans for you. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God God bless you. See you tomorrow.